Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're online watching today. And, uh, you know, we're going to be doing things a little bit different uh, the next few months with the whole COVID, cor coronavirus, and the and the uh, stay-at-home orders and things like that. But uh, but we're still going to be having church here at uh, First Baptist Gracemont. And uh, so uh, we hope you join us online. You hope you watch these web videos. Uh, you'll still have different pastors coming to uh, visit you guys and, and uh, do these. So... Uh, Hope you enjoy this. I hope you get something out of it. And continue to pray for your church. Continue to tithe for your church. Uh, those There's just so many things that uh, people are are um, worried about when it comes to church and church services and gatherings. And, uh, you know, um, one thing I want to talk to you guys about um, with that and uh, just different things is I want you to understand it's going to get better. The church has always been here to give comfort, to give support, to give help. And, uh, you know, there's going to come a day where this just keeps getting better and, and uh, this is all going to pass. Before we start tonight, would you uh, just bow your heads and pray with me and uh, just take a moment to just give God thanks for all the blessings in our lives. Um, just take a few minutes to pray for um, your friends, your family, um, our uh, leaders in our state and our country, and uh, everybody who's working just to um, get through this situation um, as fast and as best as we possibly can. So let's pray for a minute. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today, Lord. Just thank you for all the blessings you've given us. Lord, just we know during this time there's just so much fear and worry and panic and just different things going on, but we can also take comfort in knowing you are in control and that you are you are a gracious God and a loving God and most of all a protecting God who is just here to just let us let's just take some time tonight to focus on you, to just love you and grow closer to you, and just um, to hear from your word and just see the example of Joseph as he's as he lived a life of of stress and of worry and just let us realize and just see that you know during a time of crisis things will get better lord and just um just pray, pray that you'll just shine through this message today in christ's name amen um you know for uh, the last few weeks i've been trying to do a, this the series called um, um the why do we's and why do we do this and why do we do that in the church and uh, i'm going to push that aside for a while and um, i've started a new series called it's going to get better and uh, the goal of this series is just to show God's people um, go through their lives, their entire lives from start to finish, and just even though they had hard times and struggles and death and, and diseases and plagues and just different things that could happen today, but different problems that these people faced in their lives, it got better because it was God's purpose for them. And uh, so the title of this series tonight is, It's Going to Get Better, The Life of Joseph, Joseph Genesis 37 through 50. Now, I promise you this, we're not going to read all of that. We're not going to go through 13 chapters of the Bible or, uh, um, and read all of that. So I'm going to paraphrase some of it. I'm just going to take the highlights of a few chapters and just share that with you. And then we're going to take five simple lessons from this uh, that we can apply to our everyday lives while we're going through this coronavirus. And then even afterwards, it's something we can look back on and, and just see how God worked through it. So in Genesis 37, if you want to summarize the life of Joseph, now, this is, this is um, not Joseph, the father of Jesus. This is Joseph in the Old Testament. Um, this is not um, Jesus' stepdad, if you will. Um, so, um, the life of Joseph. Joseph, a couple things in uh, chapter 37 is um, he uh, had a dream. He had a prophecy. He had a dream um, of some bushels of wheat were going to bow down. They bowed down to his bushel of wheat. And there were stars in the sky, and they bowed down to him. And uh, he woke up, and he symbolized this was his family. Family. This was his brothers, this was his mom and his dad and his sister, and it made his brother, his whole family jealous. Joseph was already his dad's favorite. Um, he, uh, his dad gave him kind of the blessings of life and the blessings, and uh, everyone knew that this was kind of his favorite. Now, if you're kind of like me, I would probably be a little jealous too. You know, if I'm in a big family, and you know, usually the ones who are working in the field should be the favorite, or the ones who are doing the job, and the ones who are firstborn are, are the favorite kind of in this time period. Um, but Joseph was the youngest so it made his family mad when they bowed down to him, and um, uh, it made his, his brothers very jealous. So jealous that they plotted to kill him. 
They were going to kill the baby brother. Um, and again, how would you feel in a situation where a 7-year-old boy told a 15-year-old brother or a 16-year-old brother, you know, you're going to bow down to me someday. You know, they're going to look at him and first of all just think you're crazy. That's not going to happen. Or they're going to kind of be upset about it. And they did so. His brothers plotted to kill him. And one of the brothers said, we can't kill him. We can't have his blood on our hands. That would be t a terrible thing to do. It would be a terrible thing for our family. It's not right. So they just went and threw him into a pit instead. They threw him into a cistern. So the seven-year-old boy Joseph is in this pit, and he's wondering, why have my brothers done this to me? Why am I down here? Why is all this happening? And uh, the brothers were still thinking, we can't just leave them there to die. We've got to do something about this. So they sold him into slavery. Now, again, how horrible of a childhood is it for somebody who's maybe 7 to 10 years old, and their brothers plot about killing him. They throw him into a pit. They don't like you. They're mean to you. And then, at all of that, they sell you into slavery. Just a terrible, terrible childhood for a kid. Um, but in Genesis 39, 1 through 20, there's a little more to it than that. Um, during this time, Joseph was sold to a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar is um, in Egypt. He lives in Egypt. And uh, he is kind of one of the uh, second or third in command of all of Pharaoh's, um, Pharaoh's life. He's, he's, he's a high up official. He, 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 uh, he has this like wealthy and luxur luxurious life. And Joseph becomes one of his slaves. Now, the land of Canaan where Joseph was born is 300 miles away from Egypt. And I did the math on that from right here at this church in Gracemont. Um, Oh, my goodness. Uh, Branson, Missouri. Branson, Missouri is 303 miles away from here. That is where my wife and I planned on going on spring break before all of this happened. It was going to be our 10-year anniversary, and that was an easy trip. We're like, hey, it's going to take us four hours to get there. We'll drive. We'll go to this place. We'll see that. That's an easy trip. But for this time period, walking by foot is just something you wouldn't do. There's very little to no reason at all to walk 300 miles from point A to point B during this time. You have everything you need at your home. You have your goods and your farmland and your oxen and you have your, your, your sheep and you have everything you need there. There's no reason to just go walk 300 miles across a desert to go somewhere else. So the chance of Joseph ever getting back home is slim to none. The chance of Joseph ever seeing his brothers and his father and all that, even if he did escape from slavery at some point, it wasn't going to happen. Um, so, um, but now with that too, Potiphar put Joseph in charge of everything. Potiphar kind of looked at Joseph and looked at his life and the things he was doing as he grew older, and Potiphar put him in charge of everything he had. And then as... Joseph is living this life. Um, something bad happened. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. Potiphar's wife tried to sleep with Joseph. And Joseph said no when he left. And this happened multiple occasions. I think it was three occasions, actually. And the third time, Joseph ran. And he ran so fast that he actually left his cape. He left his tunic there um, at the spot. And, jo and Potiphar's wife actually said that he raped her. He said that he slept with me. He, and I screamed and I ran. And he told his husband, he, I'm sorry, she told her husband this. And Potiphar got angry with Joseph. And he said, you are a slave. I can't believe you did this to me after all I've done for you. And he threw threw him into prison. He threw him into the Pharaoh's prison because, again, Potiphar was a wealthy, wealthy man. So Joseph was going along life and he was doing everything right, even through this bad situation of, of, of being, um, becoming a slave, and then he's working and he's still doing these things. He lived this life and he's doing everything the thing, way he should do it, and he ran away from Potiphar's wife and he still got in trouble. Bad things still kept happening. That's Genesis 39 through 20. But something beautiful I want you to hear from this. In Genesis 39, 2 through 3, it says, The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave, the Lord gave him success, he, uh, and all he did, Joseph found favor in the eyes, in his eyes, and became Potiphar's attendant. So what that's saying is, Joseph was being blessed by God even during the bad times. During the slavery, be, being thrown in the pit, doing all these things. No matter what Joseph did, good things were happening because God was blessing him. 
And that's something very important to remember because so many times we're going to go through this and guys, you know, this is just the start of this whole virus. This is just the beginning of it. It's going to get a little worse probably before it gets better. It's going, we're going to have some hard times. But even during these hard times, God is still going to bless his people. God is still going to protect his people and love his people and give success to his people. So don't, don't, don't turn your back just because the doors of a church are closed. Don't step away from God and your quiet time and your prayer time and all those things because difficult times are going to come. God still wants to bless you through the difficult times. Um, in Genesis 39 through 20 uh, and tw through 23 says, but while Joseph was still there in prison, so Joseph has been thrown into the prison, um, and he's there, and he's li he's probably been shackled, he's put into this jail. It says, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the warden, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did. So again. You know, now he's in jail. Joseph is in jail for something he didn't do. And, you know, we watch movies about this. We read books about this, about people who go to prison for things they didn't do all the time. And then when they, they get free and they're excited and, you know, they, they, you know hopefully in the story they, they get out. But people say they can get convicted. Joseph was in jail for something he never did. And the Lord blessed him and gave him, showed him kindness and granted him favor. In the eyes of the warden. So again, Joseph is in prison and he's living the right life for God while he's there. In such a way that the warden looks at him and goes, there's something special about him. There's something different about this guy. He's not like all the other inmates and all the other, all the other slaves in prison and all the other people who have been here for the things that they've done. There's something different. The Lord's giving him success in everything he did. I'm going to put him in charge of some stuff. You got to be living a certain kind of life in a certain kind of way for God if a prison warden's going to look at you and say, I'm going to use this guy. There's something different about him. So now we're going to jump up to Genesis 40. Um, Joseph is still in prison and he's doing some of the work that the warden has given him to do. And uh, there's a cupbearer and a baker that are in there that have actually been sent away from Pharaoh. Um, they got in trouble they, for whatever reasons, and they were sent to the prison. And um, the cupbearer and the baker had these dreams. And he, they were like, I don't know what this means. What do these dreams mean? Well, if you remember, Joseph was interpreting dreams ever since he was a child. You know, he was having dreams even then. And he told the cupbearer and the baker, he said, in uh, just three days, you're going to be put back where you were. You're going to go back to the Pharaoh, and you're going to live that life again. And uh, sure enough, they did. He, they fulfilled the dreams that they had. And, uh, then, <clears throat> so, and then the story just kind of stops there for a little bit. Well, if you go to chapter 41, um, Pharaoh begins to have some dreams. Um, Pharaoh has a dream that there's seven um, good cows walking along a bank, and then there's seven sick, nasty, looking like zombie-like cows walking along in front of him. And he didn't understand it, and he didn't know what it meant. And uh, the cupbearer and uh, the cupbearer remembers, hey. You know what? There's a guy that we met that interpreted our dreams exactly like they were. And Pharaoh calls for Joseph to interpret these dreams. And Joseph does. Joseph says, oh, I know that. And Joseph says, there's going to be seven great years of crops, seven years of abundance and awesomeness and greatness going through here. But then there's going to be seven years of famine. And there's going to be seven bad years. And we've got to prepare for these things. We've got to get ready for it. And jo that's what Joseph tells him. And Pharaoh decides, you know what? Wow, this is awesome. I'm going to put you in charge of every single thing in all of the land of Egypt except for me. You are in charge of the crops. You are in charge of the money. You're in charge of the finance. You're in charge of the people. You are in charge of everything that we're going to go through in the next 14 years. Um, so, And the prophecy becomes true exactly like Joseph said. And, you know, to have... I just can't imagine that, you know, Donald Trump would come up to me someday and say, you know what, Zach, I'm going to put you in charge of everybody, but you're just not my boss. I'm going to have you plan out our entire country's future for the next 14 years and then some because you have done this one thing. It's not going to happen. Can you imagine any king throughout the history of mankind, any president, any prime minister just saying, hey, you're in charge now because you've done this right. Now, I think a little bit about that had to do with, again, the way Joseph was living. But, 
in verse 41, 16, when Pharaoh says, interpret my, team, uh, my dream, man, Joseph says, I cannot do it. He says, but God will give you the answer he desires. So what Joseph said, Joseph could have said there, st uh, stood there with, the, with Pharaoh and just gave him the explanation, and Pharaoh would have done these exact same things probably. But he said, I don't interpret dreams. God does. God does this through me. God is the one using this body, this vessel, to do this gift. And uh, with that, Pharaoh just looks at him and goes, wow. Goes, wow, again, there's something special about this. This God is amazing that works through this man. And because of that, that you've got to be humble to do that. You know, that's one thing that I think a lot of pastors, um, I think uh, there's pastors in this world, there's athletes in this world, there's a lot of people in this world that become me, me, me at some point because they get good at something. And it's not them that's doing it, it's God putting the power through them. It's God putting the, God using those people in circumstances. And God wants to use us in those same, in those same ways. But, but Joseph was so humble, he was able to say, I don't do this. This is not me. This is not what I do. God does this. And Pharaoh put him in charge of everything for the next 14 years to get them through the situation. Now, we're going to continue on um, a little further. So, again, Joseph was in Canaan. He was sold into slavery. He was thrown in the pit. He was left and abused by his brothers a little bit. And he got to Egypt. He was accused of rape. He, was, he became a slave, and he was accused of rape, and then thrown into jail. And in jail, he um, lived another, and he kept living a life for God during all this stuff. And it went from, again, a boy to a slave to first in command over all of Egypt. That's an amazing story in itself. I could end that story right now, and you could put that into a movie, and 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 uh, when you know, and it would be a box office smash, a rags to riches story, having the ups and the downs and the problems and all that stuff, and an overcomer story about a man becoming a king from just a little boy to a slave to a king. But the story goes on. There's more to it than that. Um, in Genesis 42, chapter 42, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt for food. Joseph's brothers came to him. And many years have passed. I mean, when they last saw Joseph, he was probably 7 to 10 years old maybe. And now he's a man. He has a beard. He's a grown-up. He's an adult. And uh, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt from Canaan because they had no food. They, had, they didn't know about the drought. They didn't know about, you know, the, the, they were going to be able to grow crops and things like that. And they were in trouble and they were about to starve. And they went to Joseph and they bowed before him just as the prophecy said that he, they would. They bowed to him saying, you know, as, as the first in command of Egypt said, we need your help. Will you feed us? Will you take us in? Will you help us? Is there anything you can do for our family? And Joseph didn't tell them who he was. They didn't recognize him. But they talked to him a little bit. Joseph knew who they were. They were a little older. He recognized who they were. Oh, went a little too far. Here we go. And uh, I think this is beautiful. In Genesis 45, 5 and 6, in verse 8, it says, And now do not be distressed do not be, and, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save the lives that God sent me ahead of you. So then it was not you who sent me, but God. Joseph looked at his brothers and he said, I am your brother Joseph who you sold into slavery. And they stood right in front of him in a room similar to a church right here in a palace in a big area where he is sitting on a throne and he's sitting in, a, in this royal chair and he tells them, he stands up and he says, I am your brother Joseph. I am not dead. I am not a slave. I am here. And you know those brothers had to be terrified. You know, and it even says they trembled with fear. They were afraid. And Joseph says, don't be afraid. This was God's will for my life. I'm sorry. My brothers, have, my brothers have done a whole lot less to me than that in my lifetime. And I held a grudge against them. And I was mad at them. And I was angry with them. They did a whole lot less to me as a kid. And you can probably relate to that being... Um, you know, having siblings and think about the meanness and the pranks and the jokes and the, and the things and the teasing and the nitpicking. And you got so mad at them about that. This guy had his brother sell him into slavery. They went home and told their father that he was dead. And now they're, they even showed up in his court, in his place, asking for food. And 
And, he, and they, they even told him there in that moment, we have one brother that died, but the rest of us are at home. The rest of us are here and at home. They lied to him, telling him that he was dead. And he said, and again, Joseph just says, don't worry. Don't be angry with yourselves. Don't feel bad about this. This was God's will for me to be here because this is how we're going to save Egypt. How beautiful is that? How humbling is that? That he didn't hold a grudge about it. And then we're going to move on a little bit. So um, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers like that. He forgives them because of the big picture. Joseph forgave his brothers. His brothers and father moved to Egypt and became part of the royal family. They uh, had jobs. They became shepherds and workers. They talked to Pharaoh about it. Pharaoh approved because of all the great things that Joseph has done for the, for the kingdom of Egypt in this time. And um, later on, many, many years past this, they live happily ever after. And then Joseph's father dies. You know, Joseph's father passes away just like anybody does as an elderly man. But Joseph's father did not want to come to Egypt at first. He wanted to stay in his homeland of Canaan. He wanted to be there. And he said, before I come, promise me that you will bury me in the land of my people. Bury me back in Canaan where I'm from, where my father was, where my family was that has passed away before me. And Joseph made that promise. And um, so, anyways... Joseph's father dies, and Joseph asks Pharaoh to keep that promise, and Pharaoh agrees. Pharaoh says, you know, take everything you need to go bury your father back there. Um, and that's just another step of how faithful Pharaoh was to people who were faithful to him at that time, too. Um, but to carry on with that, Joseph, now, Joseph's father has died. So again, his brothers go back into fear mode. Oh, no, the only reason he didn't kill us before was because Dad was here. You know, he didn't want to do that and bring shame on our household. He didn't want to disappoint Dad, and now Dad's gone. What are we going to do? Is he going to kill us? Is he going to punish us? Is he going to make us a slave? What's he going to do? And in Genesis 50, 19 through 21, um, Joseph says, um, says to his brothers, Don't be afraid. I am in the place of God. You intended to harm me, but God intended it, intended it for good to accomplish what is being done. Um, the save, for the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you. I will take care of your children. And, be, and he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Again, Joseph had every... Because of his past and the hard times and everything he went through, because, you know, his brother started this whole motion process, he says, it was God who wanted me here for the good of Egypt, for the saving of many lives. You know, Joseph saw the big picture. Joseph saw that through tragedy, good was still coming. And Joseph had the ability to forgive his brothers and bless them and love them still. And he was kind to them throughout all those things. Um, you know, and I said it a minute ago, we hold a lot, little, we held some big grudges for little situations in our lives. Nothing like Joseph went to, went through. Joseph is the ultimate example of forgiveness through people. I mean, to be able to do what he did. Um, now again, that was a long story of someone's life in a short period of time. That's, that's f uh, 14 chapters of, of the book of Genesis all summed up into about 15 minutes. Um, you know, I challenge you, take some time and read through this and, and see the life that he lived and see what he went through and, and, just, and just enjoy the life of Joseph a little, Joseph a little bit. But um, before we dismiss, there's five lessons I want you to take away from this. Just five quick lessons to get from the life of Joseph. Lesson one, difficult days have a purpose. Difficult days will have a purpose. Um... um so uh, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7 says, For every reason, make every effort to add, good to, your to, add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. Um, I put this in here because of the word perseverance. Guys, you cannot have perseverance in this world without a hard time. 
without a difficulty, without a struggle, without something bad happening. We have, we have to persevere. The only way we can persevere is if some tragedy happens. You know, those tragedies sometimes bring us back into focus. Tragedies sometimes put priorities back in order. Sometimes tragedies take things away from us that we shouldn't have had there in the first place. But without tragedy, we cannot have perseverance. So um, tragedy, difficult days and tragedies have a purpose. Um, they had a purpose for Joseph. You know, when Joseph went through his life, there was a reason that he was sold into slavery. There was a reason that he was accused of rape. There was a reason that he was sitting in that jail that day. There was a reason the two cup, the cupbearer was sent to prison that day. There was a purpose for every bit of that. And it all came to flourish in the end, and it was for the betterment of, of Egypt, and it was for the betterment of the people to save many lives. You know, today going through this corona stuff, we may not see a purpose in it. We may see it whenever these messages like this reach the end of the other side of the earth. Um, we may see it when, when uh, other churches are, are um, doing podcasts like this and doing, doing uh, Facebook Lives and doing opportunities like this and more people are reaching, um, more people are being reached by God's word than they were just by sitting in a pew two weeks ago. You know, we don't see it now, but we're going to see it later. Um, lesson two, Ooh, here we go. God's plan is better than our plans, especially during the chaos. You know, when we're in the middle of the storm, when we're in the middle of the chaos, when we're in the middle of the hard times, we don't see God's plan sometimes. And that's probably a good thing um, because God, and it's better that, you know, his plan is different than our plans because in the middle of all that chaos, he knows what's going on. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ. It doesn't say give thanks when times are easy. Only give thanks when you're happy. Only give thanks whenever it's a joyful moment. Give thanks when you're sad. Give thanks whenever a bad time happens. Give thanks whenever you're mourning. We're going to have some bad days, guys. Give thanks in those circumstances. Give God thanks during this chaos. Um, you know, uh, this morning I'm having to talk with uh, Titan and Paisley. Can we go to Nana's today? No, guys, we're not going to go to Nana's for a while. Well, why not? You know, and Titan and Paisley are, are six and seven years old, and I'm having to explain to them everything going on and how this works and, and why we can't, you know, this, you know, Nana might have germs and, you know, just trying to explain that down to a kid's age. You know, we don't, you know, they don't understand these circumstances, but we got to give thanks during these tough times. You know, they probably, the longest they've probably ever gone without seeing grandparents in person is probably three days, and it's been over a couple of weeks now, and it's going to be months. You know, there's going to be some chaos. Give God thanks during the chaos. Um, people are going to be going through a lot worse than that. Still give thanks during the chaos. Uh, lesson three. Don't let anger get the best of you when difficult times come. Um, so, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. James 1.20 uh, you know, we're going to have days, I, you know, through all this, some people are going to lose family members. Some people are going to lose friends. Um, some teachers might pass away from this virus. Some family members of teachers and things like that. And, and the kids, um, some of them may not come back to school whenever we start school again. We don't know the ramifications of all this to some point. Um, don't let anger get the best of you because here's what's going to happen. Just like Joseph during all these bad situations that happened to them, it never once talks about him being angry. It never once shows him point his finger at God and say, God, why did you do this to me? Why did you put me in jail? Why did you let that happen? Why did you throw me down in this pit? Why did you allow my brothers to sell me into slavery? He never got mad at God about it. He went with it and served God in the good times and in the bad times. Uh, with a with a with a thankful heart, with a with a with a gracious heart to God. Don't let anger get the best of you when difficult times come, guys. If you are a godly people, if you have accepted Christ into your life as Lord and Savior, people are going to be looking to you 
as help, for help. They're going to be looking to you as the example of how you're surviving this coronavirus. They're going to be looking to you at how you handle a death or how you handle a sickness whenever a sickness does come to your family. They're going to be looking to you whenever everyone's going stir crazy because Netflix runs out of TV shows for them to watch and you're still being okay about it. They're going to be looking to you during all of these different things, and you're going to be the example to them of what godly people are supposed to look like. Don't let anger, don't let the example of a godly, Christ-like person be full of anger. Be the example for those around us. Lesson four, forgiveness is essential in God's plan for your life. Forgiveness is essential in God's plan for your life. Um, Ephesians 4, 31 through 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. Um, guys, if we're going to get through this, and we, we've got to be a forgiving people. During chaos and hard times and difficulties, we got to be a forgiving people. And again, I look at Joseph, and I, if I could, if I could mimic anybody in the Bible, I've said many times, if you know, uh, Paul said, "Follow my examples." I follow my, the example of Christ in 1 Corinthians eleven one. Um, you know, I, I would live a life like Paul. I would want to be a Paul in this world, but next to him, I would want to be a Joseph. You know, I think there's a lot of people in this world that, uh, that uh, follow Jesus through and through until a difficult time comes and then they back away uh, or they get angry and different things like that. But, but with Joseph, he lived a life of forgiveness. You know, it didn't say that he forgave Potiphar and he forgave Potiphar's wife, but, you know, if he could forgave his brothers that easily, I'm sure he did the same for them. Um, at the end of his life, whenever he was thrown, whenever he could look back and see all those bad things that went, went through his life, he forgave his brothers and loved them and took care of them, even though the bad times were there. Guys, if you're holding a grudge right now with somebody, if you're holding a grudge with a family member or a friend or a coworker, guys, forgiveness is essential in God's plan for your life. God has never, in plan, never planned for us to hold on to that anger and hold on to that, uh, the malice and hang on to those things in our life. We're supposed to forgive like Christ forgave us. I think forgiveness is one of the hardest, hardest, I think forgiveness, unforgiveness is one of the biggest sins that we have in our lives. Just holding on to it for years and years and years just because we don't want to be the bigger person to say, I forgive you and let it go. Because that's what Christ did for us. That was lesson number four. Lesson number five, when God, cho when God has chosen you, circumstances won't ever change that. If God has chosen you, if you have accepted Christ in your life, you are, you are a child of God. You are a chosen people. You, are, you, are, you have a plan and a purpose, and God has put you in this place for a reason. Circumstances do not change that. The loss of your job during this does not change God's plan for your life. Not being able to pay the rent does not, that circumstance does not change who God has chosen you to be. Not, um, you know, if there's, there's illnesses due to the virus or whatever it is, God has chosen you and circumstances do not change that. You are in God's hand and you are a chosen people and you are set before you are set with a path and a plan and a purpose every day of your life and the circumstances of this world are not going to change that. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light. You are ch a chosen race, and it is beautiful. Guys, if you've accepted Christ into your life, you have a plan through this whole COVID-19 situation. You're going to have a plan. God has a plan for you after this and whenever no for the rest of your life there is a plan for you don't let the circumstances of today persuade you and take you away and change what you what god has planned for you for tomorrow um i think a lot of people are doing that right now and i'm gonna read that one more time but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. God has a plan for you today. 
If you've accepted Christ into your life, there is a plan and a purpose and a destination for you in this world and after. God loves you. God is going to take care of you. When using Joseph, when, when he was just a little boy, he had these dreams that his brothers were going to bow down to him at some point. And he struggled and he had difficulties. He went through slavery. He was thrown into a pit. He was accused of rape. He was thrown into prison. And all the way at the end of his life, there came a day where his brothers still walked up to him unknowingly, bowed their heads down to him, and said, we need you. We need your help. Help us. God put a plan in motion all the way when he was seven years old, all the way to the day where he was in command over all of Egypt. God has a plan and a purpose for your life from the day you accepted him into your life as Lord and Savior all the way until you take your last breath on this earth. God has a purpose, purpose and a beautiful plan for you. Do not forget that. Now, maybe you've never accepted Christ into your life as Lord and Savior. Maybe you don't have a plan. Maybe it's just chaos and fears and worries and corona this and self-quarantine that and, and germs here and germs there and all those things. Maybe that's where you're at right now. If you're watching this video then and you feel God talking to you and you feel like you need to make a decision in your life, just hit your knees and just pray to accept Christ into your life today for the first time. Just say, God... I need you to be Lord and love of my life and start living today for him. You had that opportunity. It doesn't matter if you're standing in a ch sitting in a church pew or you were at home or you were listening to this somewhere in your car. If you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's a perfect opportunity to do that. Um, we're going to pray and we're going to close this down. Um, I, hope you've, I hope you've learned a little bit about Joseph. I hope, hope maybe his life can impact your life a little bit. I hope maybe his attitudes and his morals and, and his uh, lifestyle can be, you can take things from his life and put into your life. And again, if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, right now is the perfect time to do that right where you're at at home. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. Thank you for all the blessings you've given us, Lord. We just thank you for the life of Joseph, that he just lived this life where we can just look at and go, wow, I want to live a life like that. I want to live a forgiving life and a life that searches God and a life that, that God blesses because, you're, because I'm one of his people, Lord. Lord, if there's someone who just doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, just pray that they'll just take, that, take this moment right now to just ask you into their heart and their lives and just begin to start that journey with you, Lord. Um, God, just thank you for this opportunity and just pray for this whole coronavirus, COVID-19 situation, Lord. We pray for every homebound person um, that they will just continue to seek you. And even though we're not walking into church buildings, we're still having church, Lord. Uh, even though we're unable to meet together in large groups, that you are still moving through these church people, Lord. God, we want to lift up every worker, every every. Uh, every nurse and doctor and everybody ambulance and everybody on the front lines that's just kind of helping to combat this and just just pray for their health and their safety and just pray that you will be done lord and just want to pray for everybody that's affected by this that you will continue to heal their bodies and just um move in great awesome and amazing ways lord lord we just thank you and praise you and honor you always in christ's name amen